Hello, homebrewed Christianity listeners. This is Trip, and Trey Pearson's on the podcast again, so uh, he hasn't broke up with me yet. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm fantastic. How are you, Trip? Oh, well, this, since I get to talk to one of my cool friends, I'm just like feeling better about myself. <laughs> me too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm feeling better about yourself. Oh, that, that's so good. Look at this. My shirt. I mean, it's a t-shirt, except it has a pocket with a zipper on it. It's almost like I've never, that's your rock star shirt you wear when you're around me. <laughs> yeah. I got this zipper shirt. It makes my t-shirt not a t-shirt. Now I feel oh, cool. Gosh. That's what I'm talking about. So if you put anything in a t-shirt with a pocket, it's just going to be like a giant lump right on your chest. So I don't know what you would stick in it. Maybe like one piece of paper, a post-it, anything else. It's just going to be lumpy. <laughs> maybe a fruit snack <laughs> yeah <No? laughs> like a uh we have a lot of star wars themed fruit snacks in my house uh, i'll give you like a third nipple up there <laughs> oh like the the lady who uh reads fortunes and in mall rats <laughs> oh man but you were in youth group then so you didn't watch uh worldly movies i wasn't uh, allowed <laughs> Anyway, that's funny. <laughs> what? I said, you think that's funny? <laughs> well, everyone has things to go to therapist about. Um, <laughs> so, so uh, it, it's been a while since you you were on the podcast, and um, for for people who who don't know you previously uh, from previous episodes, uh, why don't you just give us a little introduction to yourself? Sure. Uh, well, my name's Trey. I started a band called Everyday Sunday when I was 16 and signed a record deal not too long out of high school. I've toured full time for a lot of years now. I've been in all 50 states and 20 countries and I've had a decent amount of success in that world. I've had five number one U.S. singles, uh, 15 top tens and uh, left my label a few years ago, but I've continued to tour full time. Uh, and release a couple independent projects, mostly as Everyday Sunday. Uh, and then I also did a side project last year with a friend called Populous. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and I know like the first time we got to hang out, um, I, I don't know if this has been on the podcast, but I, if you get like a, a email from Rob Bell that's like, meet Trey, meet Trip, Trip, meet Trey, y'all should hang out, then you kind of say yes that's like yeah. life, life rules is like when rob is insisting you meet someone it, always um, say it, yes to rob yeah, well no <laughs> that's meeting someone you know like right, right, i figure right. he he's like a matchmaker for uh theological <laughs> questioning types yeah no um we got coffee down in your turf for dondo beach right yes and uh I was so nervous to meet you because I'd been nerding out on your podcast a little bit leading up to meeting you. And between him and my friend Bo Eberly, uh, we ended up hanging out. And not too long after that, you invited me to come to uh, Wild Goose Festival to share my story at yeah. that time. <laughs> at least yeah. my story up to that point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, well, you know, I'm, I, uh, on behalf of Satan, I like to corrupt people on a consistent basis. Oh, my gosh. Uh, I like to... Uh, invite them into images of of god where god's at least as loving as jesus um where they can uh, think critically and faithfully at the same time um where even someone with as high a sanitation grade and uh and and use of hair product that you have you could go camping um, with the least of these who don't know how to use hair product or sanitation and, and we went to Wild Goose, and what was it two or three years ago? It was the first time, right? Ah, uh, you know what? I want to say it was almost four years ago. Yeah, four years ago. Anyway, I think so. Well, if it, if you if you're like saying to yourself, "What's a Wild Goose?" It's like a religion, faith, spirituality, arts, music festival in the mountains of North Carolina, and you should go because I'm going to be there and doing a bunch of stuff. Trey's going to be there. And um, we may or may not, during the Homebrewed Christianity podcast, have a sing-off. And I'm already <laughs> like, should I even try to sing? Because with my dance moves already in my back pocket, Trey has no chance. Um, but 
<laughs> I might sing and dance, which will just like you may as well may as well tap out now, Trey. But um, with you can use Goosecast twenty sixteen, and then you'll get twenty five percent off the ticket. Goosecast twenty sixteen, and then they get twenty five percent off their ticket to come watch me demolish you in a sing off and such. But you'll and, also and hang out with us at the beer tent. Yes, and. Uh-huh. And I, I'm no, I know how to beer in hymns like a champ. It's one of my spiritual gifts. <laughs> I, I'm working you know, on other it. things I do is I let people buy me drinks. So oh my like, God. Yes, you said to yourself, I want to buy Trip a drink and talk to him about X, Y, or Z. As long as it's a theological topic, there's a high chance that uh, I'll say yes. That's um, I figure it's it's uh, letting people like just being hospitable. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> oh god so so, so uh, when when we first met and you're going to wild goose you grew up uh at conservative wesleyan in ohio so what were those kind of like first questions that made you uh step out of your theological comfort zone uh actually it's even more intense than that if you remember i actually grew up calvinist oh yeah and well, then, uh, i just try to block that out about friends <laughs> and then I got invited to a Wesleyan church at the age of 14 to a youth group. And so, um, you know, the kind of stuff I was dealing with as a teenager was, uh, was that theological, like, oh, predestination versus free will sort of thing. So even having to think about sort of John Wesley's thoughts on, um, God and, uh, you know, thinking about the Wesleyan quadrilateral and how that, uh, compared to Calvinism, uh, that had made me step out and try to start to figure out deep theological questions uh, at a very young age. But even before then, you know, um, growing up in a Calvinistic home, I was struggling with what I was taught to believe and really uh, wanting to believe what I was handed and really trying to study the Bible. I mean, I think, you know, as a teenager, I read the Bible front to back uh six times before you know and that's not even including uh the uh million times you read you know your whatever same passages over and over but uh yeah i think i was always kind of on a journey but uh you know as a young adult uh it, it, it continued in rob bell would put out these numa videos if any of you remember that uh that would really strike me in this new refreshing way that I hadn't heard in a long time when a lot of, I don't know, a lot of what I was hearing would feel stale a lot of the time in the world that I came from. And, uh, and so I got super into Rob and he released his first book, Velvet Elvis, and that rocked my world. It scared me to be honest. Uh, there were things in it that I was like, Ooh, I don't know what I think about that. And, I've read that book a lot of times since then, and he quickly became my favorite author. Uh, but yeah, I would say like he definitely was sort of that gateway drug to to helping me kind of go on this path of resurfacing a lot of questions I had as a as a kid, and uh, really kind of thinking about them hopefully in a more intelligent way as an adult. But I would say. That was kind of the trajectory I was on, you know, from Calvinist to Wesleyan to uh, Bellion. I don't know, but uh, <laughs> I think I think uh, he should call. I mean, now to go from two of the most influential figures of all church history to to a Bellion, you know, a, yeah, the Calvinist, a Wesleyan, you know, like they're like major figures, and so I sure like I've. I told Rob he has not adopted this yet that people that are really into him should not be like a bellist or a bellist. No, you shouldn't be a bellist or like okay. a bellarista <laughs> because most people read his books <laughs> while they were at a coffee shop. Boom. Oh my God. I don't know if that's going to stick trip. <laughs> I, I, I'm just, it was free marketing advice. He needs it. Like I always tell him you are not, <laughs> Bob, you should really ask me what to do. Um, you should have long <laughs> conversations with philosophical theologians. You'll reach a whole new audience. <laughs> um, <laughs> th- one of the things that I've – the number of conversations I have with people uh, through the podcast who 
a lot of times are ministers at evangelical churches who, uh, like you, um, uh, or, or leaders in different parts of the church, like have a real vibrant faith. It inspires them to act, uh, to respond to a call vocationally, be it music and, uh, it, within, uh, the church or as a missionary or as, as a, a like nonprofit leader addressing something sure. Jesus told them to say or minister. Uh, the number of people who begin conversations when they reach out to me that start like that are so high. And um, so this is Tripp's theory off just talking to them. But uh, one of the things I've noticed when people kind of have a vocation they've chosen that's intimately connected to their faith, and then they get to a point where questions they kind of closed off from their time growing up all get reopened at the same time is they get stuck in this position where there's nothing about the questions that are antithetical to their actual relationship with God and Jesus. Right. Like that's there. And it's like, it's pulsing. And yet at the same time, they have this ghost or something in the back of their head. That's like, do not let the blood pump to that arm or like close this part of you off. And yet at the same time, you're like, wait, there's this whole new dimension of existence that, that like, yeah. I feel like the heart of Christ pumping blood into that part yeah. of my body. And um, why, why do I have this conundrum? And it's not a, like the way I hear it described to me regularly when they're telling it autobiographically, it's not like they sit down and are like, you know, I got to really look at uh, quantum notions of block time and see what that relates to, uh, notions of causality and how that would help untangle 17th century Calvinist articulations of, you know, or whatever, like, it's not that at all. It's this, right. uh, their relationship with God. Eventually there's like a dam that broke and this stuff that was off the tables on the table, but God was never off the table. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know that it's a ghost that holds us back. I think it's this thing that we are, uh, so many of us are taught in the church growing up. Don't ask these questions. And, uh, it's almost this fear that is instilled into us. And so to unlearn that, like to unlearn anything unhealthy in your life is, uh, is tough to do sometimes, but yeah, I mean, it's beautiful once that dam does break and all of a sudden you feel like, Oh my gosh, I'm allowed to ask this question. Like there's nothing wrong with that. Like nothing bad is going to happen. God's not even mad at me for asking this question, you know? <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, that was definitely a very, uh, freeing place to come to uh man i don't even know how long ago that started to happen for me but i mean it was definitely building toward that as uh velvet elvis came out but i would say that was kind of the turning point of what set me on a new path and kind of set me into listening to things like the homebrewed christianity podcast and uh you know reading so many books, you know, starting with things like N.T. Wright and Dallas, Dallas Willard and, you know, uh, you know, I guess learning from you about process theology and learning about, uh, I don't know, just different things from Richard War, Frederick Mutiner and some different mm -hmm. things on that side. Uh, yeah, it definitely felt like this thing that I couldn't turn back once I saw it. You know, once I started seeing it, you can't unsee it. So, um, yeah, it's been, an, it's been a journey up to this point, which I'm super thankful for, and I think it's why it's gotten me where, where I am. So when you go in, into a period where, like, not your faith is in flux, but at least uh, your, your location for your faith is in flux, or, like, the assumptions you have to share to be involved in certain communities or certain rooms, um, that is something ministers feel all the time. Right, like yeah. when you have, uh, so I'm friends with the, these five mega church ministers in Los Angeles, uh, who are all like at this point they're open and affirming and are trying to figure out how to say it at a congregation, and get people to be able to understand it, and right, and they don't even know how that works. Like that in in being a part of those conversations, um, I I just I feel like that's a situation where people are constantly trapped, where because of your love and in your faith and your service, you get in a situation where then people expect you to believe all this stuff for them and not even have a living faith anymore. You're like, you have to perform sure. this as opposed to. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes we live in a sphere where it's like, 
you're kind of scared to go there and you don't want to think too much about it. So it's almost easier to have somebody that you're willing to kind of call your pastor or some sort of leader in your life or whether it's a family leader, religious leader, whatever, sort of tell you what to think and just kind of tell you, yeah, I studied it, trust me. And that's easier than having to actually dig into it yourself and really think about why you actually think those things. So what is this process meant then like in your own um, uh, under like be it your faith community that you, you come from cause you still remained in Columbus and stuff. And also yeah. uh, as a, as, as an artist, I know that you've struggled trying to understand your Christian faith as a Christian artist and musician. Yeah. And- um, you know, it's been, it's been really good in a lot of ways. I, I, I think even since the first time I was on your podcast, uh, you know, gosh, almost four years ago, uh, I've gotten so many people that have talked to me that um, either listen to the podcast because they saw me post about it and they're like, oh my gosh, I, it feels so good to hear somebody else is on a similar journey as me or hearing people that listen to your podcast that hadn't even and some of them had actually been Everyday Sunday fans before. And uh, to hear that, like, an, an artist in that sort of subculture of Christian music or kind of the evangelical world, uh, that somebody that was known in that world uh, was on a similar journey to them. I just had so many encouraging stories. Uh, and, like, feeling like, you know, not like I, <laughs> I definitely didn't have and still don't have all the answers, but just, like, to know that uh, we were on – on a journey together and feeling like we were in it together. Uh, it's meant a lot to a lot of people. It also scares a lot of people. It's, um, I think maybe gotten people that sort of live in that world, uh, fearful of me or frustrated with me. I I don't really know why, but, uh, I think, um, that's been interesting to see as well. And, uh, yeah, it does sometimes feel lonely. Like, you know, like just even being able to come to affirm other people, uh, in a public way, uh, in the last few years, uh, has been kind of almost lonely within the church context sometimes, because there are some beautiful churches out there around the world that are affirming and making a huge difference. Uh, but there's a lot of cities, uh, like mine where it was really hard to find that at first. And, uh, and I think that's definitely something that's kind of in progress right now. And it's, it is very interesting to think about. Mm-hmm. So um, in the, uh, what, the 614 article, or is that? 614. 614 article. Um, you, My you, area code. <laughs> well, there you go. Um, <laughs> so uh, it, in it, it, it describes this uh, kind of interaction, I guess, with the editor or whatever, with the, the newspaper or journal. Um, happening while uh ubering so um it, it, i mean describe I, I mean that sets up this situation where you because of your own uh faith journey have less and less places uh in the church to do what you've always done be it like tour gets canceled or partners uh and all that kind of stuff yeah um i went through a very you know difficult time this last fall for those listening that aren't familiar uh, with the article we're talking about um, j- uh, magazine just broke uh, talking about kind of this transition in my life and, uh, and about seven months ago, I came to a place in my life uh, where I realized that I couldn't keep living the way I was living and uh and to be super honest and clear, I just came to the point where uh, I knew I needed to get help because, uh, sorry, I, I guess it's kind of hard to figure out the easiest way to just say it, but I came to a point this last fall where I was able to admit to myself and to my family that I was gay. Mm-hmm. And uh, because of that, I... Uh, I did go through a bit of a time where I had to cancel a tour and uh, I ended up uh, (laughs) driving for Uber for, for a while to help make some extra money uh, to, to make up for that tour. Cause you know, I was uh, married 
to a girl and I have two kids and uh, have a lot of responsibilities to fulfill. And, uh, and so that was, that was a time in my life that I needed to, uh, to do something to, to kind of come through and, and provide for my family. And it's kind of humbling when you've been touring full time for your entire adulthood <laughs> uh, to, to go out and do something like that. But uh, yeah, that's what led to, meeting the editor of 614 magazine and that has kind of uh just been great to have him and and so many people that have wanted to come to my side to support me through this and help me tell my story so uh, in the uh in the process of that kind of self discovery um what what was the like the turning point where like honesty wasn't something you ran from, but ran to like when, what, what was it that made you think yeah. you had permission to go there? I felt like I didn't have a choice. I felt like I could, I was put into a position where I felt like I could either run even though I knew I couldn't be what my wife needed me to be as her husband. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I, I could just, you know, I could run and, and keep ignoring it, keep trying to pawn it off on other things of why I wasn't able to be that, or I was, or I was able to, uh, take that moment, which I felt like was really, uh, a huge moment for me to, uh, just say, I think I need to get help. And so, you know, uh, at the time, I'm not really sure why I uh, did it this way, but, you know, like, I was almost uh, not sure to who, who even to talk to, and um, obviously, you and I have become very close over the last several years, and you've been a huge help to me through this whole process, but at the time, um, I, my friend Jonathan Martin had reached out to me. Uh, kind of randomly seeing how I was and I was in the middle of trying to make this big decision and for those of you who don't don't know Jonathan Martin he's he's an awesome uh, pastor uh, author blogger whatever and uh, and I just decided to uh, he, had, he had told me some of his journey that he was going through himself and uh, I decided to break down and tell him everything I was going through and so I uh, I quickly then he was able to help me uh, get with a therapist and counselor that was able to start uh, working with me and very understanding and sensitive to the situation of what I was going through and started working with me and Lauren and uh, it's kind of that was the tipping point but it was just coming to this realization that I I couldn't keep trying to bury what I had always been scared of deep down my whole life you know and mm -hmm. uh and I just, I knew that I wanted to be free and I knew that I wanted uh, Lauren to be free. And to be honest, um, I always thought pushing it down was the best thing for me and my family. And, uh, and I finally realized uh, in that moment that it wasn't, it wasn't working. And the only thing that was going to help any of this was for me to get healthy for myself that way mm -hmm. I could be healthy for Lauren and for my kids and for for the people around me so one of the things that immediately sticks out and I mean I think almost everyone would agree until you're in the situation right like you decide to talk and be honest with a friend and your version of the story includes him saying nothing about a bible verse or theology yeah. or fixing what you said it was a human right. being who just gave a shit, right? Like, right. like yeah. I mean, it's not shocking given just, I don't know, Jesus, that that would be like the best thing to do. But I know that so many people, regardless of where you are on the issue around sexuality, um, it's hard when you, or at least as a straight person, to engage in that conversation uh, yeah. and just treat the human being's experience as the beginning spot rather than some conclusion um, that uh, honestly is about something you don't have an experience of if you're a straight person. 
Like you have no idea what asking those questions looks like because they're not existential. And, right. and, and I mean, I think that's like an important thing to pause because I know in the article you mentioned, that's not always how uh, Christians uh, respond, but I, but it, it does, it is be, being that type of person where people decide to be honest with you. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I knew just from other people's stories uh, how this could go one way or another. And um, I was definitely very uh, nervous to talk to people about it. It's such a huge sensitive thing. And uh, um, as I did start to slowly uh, come out to myself and then to my family and then uh, slowly to other friends and, and things like that, I... Uh, I knew that I knew that there would be some people that wouldn't react in the most kind way. And so, uh, fortunately, uh, you know, most people have been pretty amazing to me, but yeah, you're right. There are some people that have like, uh, the first thing they wanted to talk about was not my experience or how hard it had been or the reality of the situation, but I still want to keep it as some kind of, topic that isn't personal it's just like this topic out there you know and uh as if well this is what the you know how do you how do you deal with that with what the bible says and like don't get me wrong i'm happy to talk about that but that's not the first thing i want to talk about when i tell you what has happened in my life uh in the sense of like this is not some thing that we're talking about a belief you know it's like yeah. it's not like what we're talking about uh what happens when you die or some something that uh doesn't affect us right now personally or 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 affect the reality of the situation that we're in in the second it's and, not how it's not even what you would do as a minister or a christian i think if someone was like oh you know i cheated on my partner or uh right. i murdered someone or um I was abused um, yeah. or anything, whether you're guilty or not on something, when something big comes up, I lost my job. Well, why did you, <laughs> I mean, like the yeah. type of follow-ups aren't there for so many things that it's mm. like, like part of being uh, in, in a faith community is like doing prayers of confession every week and like being a, com a community with people you wouldn't like choose to hang out with otherwise and trying to figure out how to support and welcome people. So many things, all that we would naturally do as people of faith, just get chucked out the window around particular issues, depending on the part of the church you're from. And right. one of the things that struck me, and um, I mean, and if I don't, I can't remember what we've talked about previously when you've been on the podcast, but um, over the course of our friendship, you've come out a bunch of times and hung out with our family, and your whole family has. So yeah. when you call to talk to me um, about, you know, having just come out to your family and stuff, um, yep. it, that wasn't like in a vacuum, you know, where it's like, oh, I'm friends with Trey, so I'm being supportive. Um, immediately, it goes to knowing your wife and your, both your kids and yep. thinking you all are all awesome and have blessed the Fuller family. So when, when you told the story, I was uh, – I was basically in awe of how your wife responded. So, yeah. um, w and I remember you like saying as much as painful and stuff that's going on, like you couldn't imagine having a better best friend there at the moment. So can you like, can you describe what it's like to, um, I don't know, in a sense, come out to people who, are wonderfully gracious, but also in fear, shock, freaking out like anyone would, I think, in that situation. Like, what's that? How does that, I don't know, what's, des describe that experience. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I was so scared. I was so scared of, like, um, how she was going to react and uh, what she would think of me and if she would still love me and, uh, you know, all those things that, I mean, telling this to the person that you love with all your heart that you've committed your life to, that you have a family with, um, it's the scariest thing you could ever do. And 
she also knew how difficult of a journey it had been for us up to that point. But I think, I think how grateful I am that she's been on this spiritual journey with me over the last several years as we talk about, um, you know, our, our entire marriage, we were married seven and a half years and, uh, kind of at the beginning of that marriage is when, uh, I had met Rob and we had become friends and started hanging out and he had kind of been, uh, helping me a ton. And as we've gotten to know you guys and have come out and visited you and stayed at your home and, uh, and as she's kind of been on this journey with me and she's come to be able to accept and affirm other people just like I have. Um, I can't even begin to describe how thankful I am for that uh, because I know how much of a difference it has helped both of us to handle this now. And so when I did tell her, uh, I, I wrote out a letter and I read it out loud to her. And, and when I told her and I got done, all she did was hug me and cried and told me how proud of me she was for being able to be honest with myself. And I knew at that moment, I knew I'd been set free. I knew I was going to be okay. And it didn't matter what anyone else thought, how anyone else treated me. Um, I just knew right then, that second, I was going to be okay. And uh, I'm so grateful to you, to Rob, to Christian, to so many people in my life that have been able to help me progress so much in my faith to be able to handle it the way that we have uh, through this. And uh, it's, uh, it's really crazy to think about almost how it had been set up to allow us to be able to process this in the healthiest way possible that we did. And uh, I'm unbelievably grateful for that. If you were, you know, going back in time and and hearing this type of conversation with someone else and trying to decide, like, whether or not, uh, you know, like, okay, well, maybe the Bible's not perfectly condemning of same-sex relations or – and but inside you're dealing with, like, your personal questions, your religious questions and stuff. What what were the – questions that pop would pop in your head as like defense mechanisms or like, well, I have to deal with this first. Or I guess I can think of with a family and things, people going, Oh, well you already married. So you should, um, yeah. Or, or you have kids or, um, do you really, it's a, what, what was it like trying to go through this process, which I know is difficult for teenagers in the church, uh, yeah. and, or college students when I was a campus minister, let alone a, you know, public Christian figure with a family. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Um, are, are you asking what I would think if I had heard somebody else say it or, or were you yeah, asking like with uh, your, if you, if you think back to like, um, I, th- I think there's a sense where a lot of times we, before we make a transition, we make the transition in our head. And so we like yeah. think it through, deal with certain things. How would you deal with this? And, and unconsciously we're shifting levers and things Yeah. Uh, before we can go all the way. But once you go there, you've kind of realized you have been processing and working on it for a while. Yeah. Um, well, I, I just think- feel like there's a lot of people who, when they hear you, share your story yeah like there'll be echoes in them on and it couldn't be unrelated to your sexuality but lots of people echoes going have i had this cement version of faith locked in where this whole depth of faith it's possible for me that i've just been closing myself off to and what is it that starts um what were those kind of deterrents or defense mechanisms or type things that you would come up when you would hear it? Uh, uh, I think a lot of it was just uh, admit being a, 
being able to admit to myself that I had these beliefs that I didn't completely know why I believed them, or I knew that there was still a lot of information missing in my own argument for defending that belief. So um, my point is, like, for example, not not even in a, like, when we talk about issues of sexuality like this, but uh, the first time I read, Lo uh, not Love Wins, uh, Velvet Elvis by Rob Bell, um, when I said it scared me almost the first time I read it, because there, like, there were things in it that felt so freeing and like, oh my gosh, that makes so much sense. But it almost scared me because then he wouldn't say things like, well, you know, like, uh, I don't remember if he was asked the question or, or how he stated it, but like, you know, what if the virgin birth wasn't true in the way that we think of it as true? You know, like, uh, what if it didn't happen? Like, what if you found that out? Would that like rock your entire belief in Jesus and your faith in Jesus? And, or would you still be able to believe the stories? And like the first time I read that, I was just almost like, it scared me. It, like I was appalled. And I, and, and really just the reason for being appalled is because it scared me. Uh, and he started to talk about faith in that book, like Springs on a trampoline, how like um, it doesn't have to shake your whole world. Uh, and it doesn't have to be anything as uh, maybe extreme in your own faith, if that's where you are. Uh, of something like the virgin birth, but you know, maybe it's what you understand about sexuality or what you understand about divorce or what you understand about, uh, gosh, for, for different, uh, churches today, it's what you understand about women speaking in the church, you know, like, and, and like, what if you find out that that thing that you were taught, you were handed that you thought you had to believe, uh, isn't true. Uh, does it have to rock your whole world and can you see it in a different way? And so even though my defense mechanism was being almost appalled and I see people do that all the time with all kinds of different theological beliefs, uh, it started to turn in my mind, oh my gosh, there's a lot I really need to figure out about what I think about this or why I think about this and why I'm so adamant about it. And not even that I have to know what I think about it, but can I not know? Is that okay? You know, mm -hmm. is it okay if I can admit, I don't know what I think about this. And, uh, and that's kind of been a journey of mine through all sorts of, uh, faith issues for my entire life. And I would think a lot of people, uh, you know, I don't know how many people believe the exact same thing they did 10 years ago, but I would guess that uh, mo most people don't. And, uh, and, I, and at first those things scare us. And then we uh, find that freedom and being able to work through those questions. Well, and, and I think part of it is whatever the issue is that comes up first for people, it in the stages of faith, um, there is a transition from, faith as being primarily assent to some fact or, or something where what do you have faith in? Is this like this objective reality of X or something, uh, be it mm -hmm. virgin uh, conception of Jesus or uh, Matthew's resurrection narrative, or I don't know, whatever the uh, thing is. Um, and, and, I, and there's a transition to other depths of faith where you have like faith. And this is, I think how Paul talks about it most of the time is being grasped by God or being seized by God. And that's like at a guttural level, not like a, I assent to this being true. Or I believe this, but to have been grasped by faith, um, to have been given a new identity. And there's that kind of existential dimension. Um, and the other side of it is like giving, and this is what Wesley emphasized is the, the faith has to do with fidelity of giving yourself to, uh, God. That's why the whole story of sanctification that he emphasized is connected to faith because, um, uh, faith is something you work out. Like you learn how to be faithful to your partner. Why? Because that's what love does. Like it, it's not a, it, it's not works righteousness or anything that's negative when you give yourself to caring for someone then you figure out what it's what it's like to love them and and i think there's a sense that people fear when god uh becomes something other than an object that they 
have as like a security blanket to protect them from whatever the world finitude hell i don't know um but uh the thing is like all the people we care most about are never like are never just objects like we have ideas of who trip is and who trey is like in your head is there oh there's trip so i have my idea of trip and i'm talking to him on the video and i have my idea of trey and i'm talking to him on the video but sure but we remain human to each other by having those objects in our mind basically function to keep the actual real relationship in our mind with each other as subjects we remain uh having a genuine relationship because we keep each other as mysteries like you and I remain a mystery to each other, and it doesn't mean we don't come to know each other better or, or that we don't love each other deeply or anything. It's just that it's each other as the subject addressing the other where genuine friendship and love develops. And I think that a lot of times people receive the stories or beliefs from their faith, and they think that's what they have faith in, and it's not what like is running in the ark. Or... Um, right. you know, or let, let's say we're sitting there and, uh, and we, we're looking forward to Michael Jackson concert or something and a limo rolls up, Michael Jackson gets out and we're all excited. We're like, okay, we're sure. gonna go to Michael Jackson. Well, uh, and he gets out and he goes in to go to the concert. I think a lot of Christians are still sitting outside looking at the limo going, that is Michael Jackson's limo. Look at the limo yeah. that Michael, the key is in that piece. You're like, actually, he went in. He's doing a concert right now. Would you like to go experience it? It's be awesome. like, no. Have you seen Michael Jackson's limo? And like, oh, it's like, game, 1611, or whatever your belief doctrine or something. And you're like, oh, no, no, no. It, it, Jesus professionally doesn't answer theology questions, I think, to avoid this problem. Right, like he asked hundreds of questions. He answers like two of them, and it's to piss rich people off who don't help the poor. All the other, he's just like, I don't know. Let me tell you a story. And Christians, will tell you about or why don't you come follow me, and then you can figure it out. Or I don't know. Um, oh, you know the greatest. Yo, you know the good commandment. You should do them more. Like he yeah. just refuses to answer people's questions and insists that they become a part of the community that does what Jesus does. And I mean, he literally promised to be three places, like in the other in Matthew 25, among the least of these in whatever way, yeah. in, like in community, especially ones where you confess your sins to each other and in, at the table. Like, that's it. That's where Jesus is like, well, I'm going to show up. This is just out of the New Testament. It's going to be like in the community where you're, we're being honest and vulnerable with each other when you're meeting people's needs and when you're caring for other people. And if you go about doing that all the time, your theology won't suck as bad, but instead, yeah. we think to protect, like we're, we're like really into the limo or really into the ideas. And Jesus is like, have you seen, have you seen that you should probably go to the concert? Like I was hoping for you not to live life scared of what's going to happen later, but to live it deeply right now. And the cosmos is throwing a really sweet concert. And like, if you skip a Michael Jackson concert, you're a loser. So, <laughs> no, yeah, definitely. And I think that's the uh, issue, like, you know, as I um, talk to people and, uh, you know, like, I think some people are, you know, like, because I think people are almost even torn in how they know me as a human being and what they think so objectively or, or whatever about some, some topic of who I am. Uh, when they're with me, they remember, oh, yeah, it's just Trey. And I love him and I know God loves him and he loves God and, and everything like that. Uh, but then when they start thinking in weird other terms, like that's when it gets messy. And I think that's, that's like when, when Jesus is asked what was the most important commandment, he's, you know, says, love your neighbor as yourself. And in doing that, you're loving God. Uh, thinking objectively about all this stuff that's fun and it's interesting and it does matter because, um, because if you don't think loving your neighbor and, and serving the poor and helping the oppressed, if, if those aren't the most important objective things, it's going to affect how you treat the person that you should be loving. And, uh, but I guess that all comes back to, um, it's funny how, you can either simply accept I should love my neighbor and that's the most important thing and I don't need to get caught up in all this stuff or 
as we do get caught up in all these ideas, it's uh, always hopefully to come back to just loving our neighbor <laughs> and loving each other and seeing God in that. Well, and I and I think a lot of the the intensities happen in the church is really us arguing over the who is your neighbor question, um, mm. and uh, and I mean Jesus straight up doozies that one when you try to get out of it. Well, who is my neighbor? And then just in case it wasn't clear, Jesus is like, oh yeah, and love your enemies, and pray for those yeah. who persecute you, and. I'm even going to forgive the people knowing me on the cross in case there's any ambiguity as to how I roll. And today we still want to argue over that as to whether, you know, I love when you say God has to be at least be as nice as Jesus, because sometimes I think like we think, Oh, well, we should love our enemies, but God doesn't love our enemies. <laughs> you know, like as if somehow we could love people more than God does. And, and I mean, that's the same, same idea of like, well, what, what do we really want to believe about uh, who this God is? Like, do we really believe we can love people more than God can? Like, you know, the people that love me for, you know, even though I'm gay, like, <laughs> don't you, do you really think you're able to love me more than God is able to? Uh, uh, what, what's amazing is why, the, I, I mean, I would hope not. I, I, feel, I really feel like as a human being, if you thought you could love someone better than God does, then um, you're you have a very high view of yourself. Uh, yeah, and a very low view of God. I know. And well, what do you think? What do you think to, or how would you like people to hear? Like, like, what if this is the first time they've had an encounter with someone they know that was a part of their faith? They were like, when I was in youth group, I rocked out to everyday Sunday tunes. Right. Like, wake up and then uh <laughs> and then they're they're listening to this conversation or reading the article or seeing uh, uh, stuff online and yeah. what's the response for someone who this is the first time this conversation wasn't just closed at the beginning like is that what's the hospitable first step instead of going all right i am uh full on board with everything trey's saying and now i'm just like a gay rights activist and like <laughs> You know what's the what's the hospitable listening from people that don't know what to do? That's a good question. I think uh, I think it would just be to say, uh, "Are you willing to dig deeper into this to try to understand deeper?" I think about um, the power of story and uh you know why jesus told, always told stories why why so many stories have affected me and helped me through what i'm getting through and, and that's why i feel like it's so important to tell my story and to talk about it because uh i realize how other people's stories have helped me get to this point and to get through what i'm getting through so um the first place is just if you're listening to this podcast or if you're listening to any of these conversations that's at least a good start because you're hearing somebody else's story of what they're going through um but you know i think there's so much out there that we try to hide ourselves from sometimes because we're scared of the truth and so um you know like for example i was uh uh talking to a guy here in columbus not too long ago uh, I was sharing him with what I, I had been through and he was talking to me. He's like, you know what? He's like, uh, you know, very sympathetic and everything like that. He's like, but, uh, and I came out to my parents when I was 18, my dad was a preacher and two weeks after I came out to my father, he committed suicide and left me a letter condemning me to hell. And I just, my heart was just, you know, as, as hard as everything I have been through has been, has been extremely hard to get to this place. I was just crushed by his story and what he was going through. And I realized this is a huge deal. This is a huge deal because of how it affects families. It affects uh, um, us. Like, you know, people like me who grow up thinking you cannot be who you are. You will not be loved. You will be looked at differently. Um, and, uh, and, and so 
Yeah, I would say hear people's stories. If if this is um, if this is the first story you're hearing like this, go get to know some gay people. You know, don't don't hide in a bubble because uh, as you find out the truth of how experience, how these experiences are, it's like what you're saying. Um, don't start with some lofty idea and figure out how to tell me who I should be from there. Listen to the experiences and figure out what does that mean in the context of what I have been taught in the context mm-hmm. of what, what I thought this meant. And, uh, and I, I guess, you know, that, at least that's my first thought, but honestly, I don't know that I have all the answers. If I did, I would be telling everyone that's still having a hard time accepting who I am. <laughs> well, and, and I don't think you have to have all the answers. I just think that there's, uh, uh, there's ways of, uh, you know, y- you can listen and not be where someone is and yeah. still avoid going on Facebook tirades uh, and all <laughs> of like ways where you could disagree with someone without being a jerk about it and yeah. you can also give people the dignity of listening uh, and listening doesn't mean a, a assent to whatever someone's saying. Um, sure. And in the, the other, like the other challenge I, I, the church has, I think are for more progressive Christians where this is not anything people have lost sleep about in a long time. You know, like, like if you're part of more progressive Christian circles, same sex relations could be a rather settled thing. And you are regularly, uh, frustrated for your more evangelical uh, friends, mm. uh, the way they handle it. Um, and as someone who has hung out um, with me at a number of different things where more progressive Christians are around and things, uh, and, and may not understand all that is involved in like the courage it takes someone like you to come out or the fear that could be in many Christians who you're in Columbus, which isn't a big, which is a pretty big city. And it's not like there, it was like, Oh, look at all these options I have as like a young gay man with children about where I can go to church. Like it, the church is not wonderfully helpful at going, you know what? Right. It's already difficult enough to be human. So let's just not have your sexuality be a, uh, a, a topic on whether or not you get to be here um, in our congregation. So like what kind of things are, or, or what kind of insights could you give for people you know, probably on the coast in bigger cities where this is just not something they look at and they normally go, Oh, look at these backwards Bible thumpers. Oh, <laughs> just, they just, they just tell the truth and be free. And like, don't be an ignoramus. Like right. describe what, what, what it's really like for large numbers of people in the body of Christ today wrestling with this issue. Um, I would say, I guess just, having compassion for uh, what people were raised with, you know, understanding, um, you know, that we all have our issues that we're dealing with, but this is still a huge issue in our country that, I mean, you gotta think it just got legalized to get married in every state in our country. Like that's, that's a pretty recent history, you know? And so, um, so then take that a step further of all the people that were fighting, allowing that to even happen. Um, you know, there's still uh, churches and religious, and it's not just, it's not just a religious thing. It is a, uh, it's not just uh, the United States that this is an issue. Like, you know, I talk to uh, Indian people all the time that tell me in India, uh, even if you're gay, you're still expected to get married to a woman and uh and and then unfortunately there there are they are trying to work through that in their own culture in their own way and uh it's not too different than what christians uh you know how christians are handling it you know and so i think um and uh that has caused me to think a lot about just even as we read the context of what we see in these scriptures uh, the way the Indian culture is handling it today is not too different than the culture, the way it was handled within the culture of the time of the writers and the very few passages that there are talking about any kind of same sex relationships back then. Um, up till this point, which it is starting to change in India, just like it is changing here. But and I, I only say 
to talk about India because I've just talked to a lot of people recently uh, from there, kind of going through through their own thing. But it's just sometimes we only see scripture from our own worldview and our own context of uh, how we think it is now. And mm-hmm. so, uh, so today we see uh, read, read these scriptures about same sex uh, relationships. Uh, what I, th- I think there's six total in the entire Bible uh, that might be referring to something like that, but it has nothing to do with how we understand same sex relationships in the United States in the 21st century mm-hmm. and how we understand it in the United States in the 21st century is not even necessarily, especially in bigger cities is not how it's understood in uh, places around the world. And so to kind of put our cultural lens on what is written thousands of years ago uh, is something that a lot of people, including yourself, are trying to say, hey, let's, let's kind of think and make sh- like see if like, this is really what they're talking about. And, uh, and so, you know, to realize that I think whether you're in a big city or a small city or in the United States or on the other side of the world, uh, that that is uh, why it's such a huge deal right now. And it's the thing that we're working through right now. And we've had to work through a lot of other things that we thought were very black and white uh, through, through our history uh, since, since the scriptures were written as well. And so uh, I do happen to think, you know, obviously it's extremely personal for me, but I also think it's very much one of the pressing issues of our time. Well, the, uh, I don't, it was a couple months ago when uh, Daniel Kirk and, and Rick Mixon, who was like the first openly gay Baptist minister, Daniel Kirk, yeah. New Testament scholar, we did an episode of the podcast called The Clobbercast that kind of yeah. goes through all the verses that get used to uh, for clobbering are uh, gay and lesbian uh, um, uh, members of the body of Christ. So, um, and, and, you know, doing it in my head, I'm like, Oh, this is kind of basic and not that nerdy and old hat. And like it, that's my, like, oh, I, Oh, it'd be fun. It'd be useful. I had no idea. Like the number of people that would send message after message about it. Like I had calls, emails, Facebook messages of people saying stuff like, you know, just listening to it and walking through and knowing that uh, I can affirm myself and still affirm the faith I have of the God I encounter reading scripture as free. Yeah. And, uh, and then I'll get an email from someone, you know, I'm, uh, who is explaining to me how that was so basic and now we've moved on to arguing about insert things that require critical theorist degrees to know what they're talking about. They're like, well, now we're on to, you know, like <sighs> queer accounts of Eucharistic bodies or some, you know, like this, like super <laughs> thing. And I'm like, yeah, like I actually think that would be fun to talk about. Um, and yet what the fact that you and I would like to have that conversation misses the fact that an extra 20,000 people downloaded this. And I had 300 messages from people who either like, from I called my son for the first time in 10 years to I got to love myself. And so I feel like one of the things that the, that stories, uh, uh, more people who tell their stories and, and then build bridges to different parts of the church is that we have the, um, opportunity to, to have the conversation wherever people are. Right, and if it takes walking through Bible verses to get around to saying you can love your gay neighbors or love yourself as a gay man, then sure, like we should do it. And if it means yeah. engaging in you know uh, different types of uh, theorists and other, if you're going to the Bay Area to discuss it, which I did, and we had a very different conversation because I was the only straight person in the room. So, um, like, I, th- I, I think that what the the larger church's conversation is showing is that when you get to hear stories, when you get to hear uh, what to some may seem like rather basic information, it actually ends up being liberating and life giving to people who don't have other options on the table until someone puts them there. And, and to me, that's been one of the, uh, one of the 
like things I've been most excited about for you, like deciding not just to experience it for yourself, but share it is like how many people are image bearers of God who don't believe it and yet sit in a pew every Sunday. Yeah. Um, probably feeling condemned rather than affirmed. Yeah. And if you think of like, and not pews, even the ones that sit in the pews, like his, but to realize how many, I mean, I can't tell you how many masses of, you know, gay people that I've met that don't sit in the pews because they don't feel loved by God because they don't feel affirmed. And uh, I, I think that's why it's important to talk about the story too. Mm -hmm. Well, sorry, I didn't mean to. No, no. I, I mean, I think that's important. Like, what, what the the reason you don't have gay members at your church that are out is because they already know what you think. It's not because gay people yeah. aren't Christian. Um, I know yeah. every congregation I visit that's open and affirming has a large number of gay members, and there's a reason. It's because the most churches. I don't know if it's written in invisible ink, have it on the side of their building. Please don't come here unless your closet door is locked tight. And, and that's just, I mean, that's just sad, but I mean, the church, well, there's is like a huge that. difference between, you know, it's like a lot of those churches will try to find the most lovingly way to tell you they don't accept you for who you are. But it's like, you know, gay people, when you're, it's not like you're living this destructive lifestyle that's destroying you or destroying somebody else. But then to be kind of told by the pastor in the church that, yeah, we still love you, uh, but we don't really love you for who you are. You know, we just love you in spite of who you are. Uh, nobody wants to be a part of that kind of church. You know, nobody wants to be looked at that way and to feel like that they're going to get some sort of uh, something out of that. Well, and, and this is probably a congregation with divorced members. Like, oh, there's yeah. no exegetical ambiguity. If you read the Bible, Jesus was against it. Now, uh, I don't think that means Jesus affirmed staying in abusive marriages. Uh, right. It was a rather progressive stance, affirming women's rights at that time. But if you have the ability to read ancient documents and pretend they were not written in a cultural context and then impose it on your gay neighbors, you should also impose uh, other oppressive things you find on the Bible on all your divorce friends. They're living in yeah. sin. Like, and then they come up with weird ways around it. Like, as opposed to going, oh, in Jesus' context, this is an affirmation of the equality of the sexes and their value, blah, blah, blah. No, don't do that. Lord knows. Uh, just come up with ways where, well, you, you lived in sin momentarily and then you're forgiven <laughs> and now you're on your fourth marriage. Right? So, the, it's just asinine. Like, right. there's, it's, it's nonsensical, and how many people, if you go to congregations, know humans who, after they have been divorced and junk hits the fan and they rework on their, uh, their own self and end up establishing healthy relationships with people that before would have been their partner that didn't have one, and they have, or they're better parents afterwards. Like I can think of thousands of people over the course of uh, my ministry or people I've met who through the process of the pain of divorce and r working through it and stuff have become better human beings and better parents and stuff. Well, but if you're going to like, just take the service of the text literally, then that that's bad. Uh, Cause Jesus was very clear. Um, and, and yet we reinterpret it because we know that's not, well, we got to interpret it in ways that make sense for us today. And yeah, and you should probably do that for the rest of it too. Like yeah. what you're doing the right thing when you don't exclude people that were divorced from your congregation and expect the congregation to be a place that affirms them and that and challenges us all to move towards greater wholeness. And Absolutely. why couldn't we do that with everyone? It's actually pretty cool. Like to know that you could go into a building and it doesn't matter who you brought with you and how much of their life they told you yet that they're welcomed they're going to be affirmed and called to greater beauty and, and depth of living. That's uh, you could call it good news even. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Well, the, the, uh, uh, hopefully if in one of the things I guess we should say, like if you are, um, is we're going to both be at wild goose. So if you, yes. you should all think about coming and hanging out with us. Um, I don't know. I don't know if Trey's going to camp. We'll, we'll see. 
Uh, <laughs> I mean, he's camped with me before, and um, the, I don't know how well he slept. Uh, <laughs> oh, goodness. I'm good at snoring. Uh, you are, but, uh, you know, I'll, I'll be camping. I'll yes. be there. Well, I don't. I never know. Like the moment when you when you're gonna be like, look, I'm gonna be in a hotel. I gotta gotta stay clean. So Wait, being in a being in a cabin doesn't sound, count as camping. <laughs> no. no, no. <laughs> if you have air conditioning right. and and a shower with water above fifty degrees, uh... <laughs> several of my gay friends tell me when they're going camping, and it's always in a cabin with air conditioning. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's Including called Richard, glamping. I know you're listening, Richard. <laughs> glamping. Yeah. Glamour camping. <laughs> oh man. Fantastic. <laughs> well. Um so so uh, uh, the last question is um w- w- what's next for you and what are some ways people listening can uh be supportive? Yeah, uh, well, what's next for me is I'm going to do what I've always done. I'm, I'm making my next album. I feel like I have a lot to write about right now and a lot to talk about. And uh, um, I'm hoping that there will be a lot of awesome people that want to continue to support me in what I do. Um, so I am going to be at Wild Goose Festival this summer. I'm also headlining a pride fest here in Columbus in a couple of weeks, which is, uh, just an awesome emotional feeling, uh, of, of this new, new phase in my life. But there's a lot of, uh, festivals that, uh, have been amazing that really want to support me around the country and around the world. And, uh, you know, I'll be doing everything from regular concerts to house shows to festivals and, uh, and continue to go where I'm able to make a difference. I want to keep writing songs and I love doing that. I'm passionate about it. I hope people want to keep listening uh, to what I sing about. And, uh, and then, you know, any, any way I can be an advocate uh, to continue to telling my story to help other people with what they're going through. I want to continue to do that as well. So uh, yeah, I think it's just super important to me and uh, you know, super excited to uh, launch all that off with uh, headlining pride here in a couple weeks. I think it's the second biggest one in the country uh, besides San Francisco and over half a million people come to hang out. And uh, I'm super honored to be a part of that to uh, give my love to so many people that have been loving to me through this process. And uh, what, what, what song are you going to sing at the end of the show then? At the end of the show? Mm-hmm. Oh, good question. Uh, I, I have not decided. <laughs> well, but you've thought about the first song? Well, yeah, a little bit, yeah. Okay. Why? Well, I just, I, I don't know, like, if I was sitting there going, oh, I'm, a, I'm, doing, I'm, I'm playing and there's half a million people there, I probably would have thought about the set list already, Trey. I don't, I don't I have a set list made out, but I don't feel like I'm ready to give that out yet. Oh, okay. All right. Well, I know... <laughs> Um, I, I hope you leave to seven sneak Mary it out of me. cover on there. And What's that? I said I, I hope you leave the seven Mary three cover cover on there. Um, there will be a killers cover on there. I'll tell I'll tell you that much. All right. All well, right. <laughs> but most of the songs will be my songs. <laughs> oh, I just had this picture of you singing cumbersome. Oh my god! Cumbersome. <laughs> I don't yeah, even know. I, the- I, would have if I thought about it. Ahead of time. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> it's just, it's such a complicated song. I don't know if you could get it put together in time. Um, you just tell them next year. <laughs> number oh, right. gosh. You're like, and there's some more, there's some more 1996 grunge tunes for you that you, that you just got to be prepared. Hey, I would throw out some third eye blind. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> do, do, do. <laughs> You want Counting Crows, I know. I don't, I don't want. I don't want to make you try to do Counting Crows. <laughs> like you don't have. You don't have like any dreads. That's true. You'd have to work on them, though. If you had dreads <laughs> and a beard, then it'd be all right. <laughs> uh huh. All right. <laughs> 
well thank you for uh hanging out talking sharing and uh all that kind of stuff thanks for having me on look forward to seeing you at wild goose oh yeah boom <laughs>